The growing faction would substitute our faith in limited government and traditional values with an agenda stitched together by little else than personal grievances and performative outrage. Republican populists would blatantly erode our constitutional norms. A leading candidate for the Republican nomination last year called for the, quote, termination of all rules, regulations, and articles, even those found in the Constitution. The truth is, the Republican Party did not begin on a golden escalator in 2015. Long before that day, it was forged and defended and defined as the conservative party in America. I mean, the truth is, Donald Trump, along with his imitators, often sound like an echo of the progressives they seek to replace. Joining me now is former vice president and Republican presidential candidate, Mike Pence. Sir, thank you for taking the time. Yeah, uh, welcome. Uh, the decision to do this and the decision to do it now, mm -hmm. It reflects what I've heard from many Republicans who've been in the party a long time like yourself. Why did you decide now was the moment for that speech? Well, Labor Day's behind us. We spent a good several days uh, in New Hampshire, town hall meetings. But, uh, you know, Republicans now are sorting out not just, not just who will lead our party, be our standard bearer in 2024, but what we'll stand for. And I thought it was important to seize that moment at St. Anselm College and really lay out what I think is a is a clear choice for Republicans, whether we're going to continue on the path of those time-honored conservative principles, strong national defense, American leadership on the world stage, limited government, fiscal responsibility and reform, a commitment to the right to life and values, or whether we're going to follow what I call the siren song of populism, unmoored to conservative principles. And my former running mate, and frankly, some of his imitators in this field are increasingly walking away from all those same principles, Phil, and I, I want people to know that uh, I'm the most consistent, the most qualified, the most tested conservative in this race, and if I'm the standard bearer, uh, we're going to lead forward a future for our party and for our country grounded in principles that have always made America strong and prosperous and free. I think my question is, you know, the inflection point you talk about this moment for the party, you know, you look at even our most recent polling in terms of uh, the issues itself. You know, your consistency on conservatism, I think, is unquestioned, whether you agree or disagree with where you are ideologically. But in terms of who would be the best candidate to handle the economy, Trump is at 69 percent. Immigration, 65 percent. Ukraine, 63 percent. Government overreach, 59 percent. Um, isn't this war over and your side lost? <laughs> well, I, I know there's, uh, there's many in the media, Phil, uh, that, uh, that would like to declare this over. But I, Labor Day is really when campaigns begin primary campaigns. And, you know, we were in Salem, New Hampshire, a big crowd turned down. A number of us candidates were there. Uh, I've been stopping into, into places across Iowa and New Hampshire where I think Republican primary voters, caucus goers in Iowa, are just now really beginning to focus their attention. But what's driving all of this is, of course, what you saw this morning here in CNN's latest poll. Joe Biden has weakened this country at home and abroad. The American people are done uh, with the failed policies of President Joe Biden. Uh, and now I think Republican primary voters and frankly, you know, many independents and many Democrats around the country are looking for that leader and looking for that agenda that will really restore our economy and, uh, and ensure our national security in generations to come. You, know, you invoked uh, President Ronald Reagan repeatedly over the course of yesterday. He was kind of the, the uh, to some degree, singular Mount Rushmore for conservatism for the last several decades. Um, I, I want to play something for you from uh, back in 2016. Listen. Late his dignified and civil way of carrying himself as president. I have a sense of this man. I have a sense of his heart. I have a sense of his hands-on style of leadership. And for all the world, he reminds me of Ronald Reagan. Donald Trump may have achieved great heights in business and in industry and in the world of entertainment, but his heart is with everyday Americans. Obviously, the first sound was from last night. Uh, the second was from uh, 2016. I think my question is, do you regret the comparison or drawing comparisons between Trump and Ronald Reagan back then? No, not in the least. You know, when Donald Trump asked me to be his running mate, we sat down. We talked about his vision for then? America. Back then? No, look, we, in 2016, Donald Trump promised to govern as a conservative. And many people believe that when he chose me, someone that had been in the conservative movement since the days of Ronald Reagan, it was evidence of the sincerity of his purpose 
And Phil, we did govern as conservatives. I mean, we stood strong on the world stage. We rebuilt our military. We stood with our allies and stood up to our enemies, and we achieved extraordinary security. And frankly, with regard to growth in the economy, we cut taxes, rolled back regulations, unleashed American energy. Uh, we could have done a better job on fiscal responsibility and reform, but I was always hopeful we would get there. And of course, we stood without apology for the right to life. But what I said yesterday in New Hampshire is that both Donald Trump and, uh, and many of his imitators in this field are walking away from those very same principles. They didn't begin with Ronald Reagan. Actually, I think, as Ronald Reagan often said, they, they came from the heart of a great nation. And I'm proud of the record of the Trump-Pence administration. Well, it was a conservative that. record. But I think Republican primary voters have a choice to make whether we're going to stay on that conservative agenda or whether we're going to drift off to the populism that many are giving voice to today. I, I, I think I, where I struggle with what you're saying right now is Trump in 2016 was not a conservative principles through and through candidate. Uh, even on issues, you know, abortion was tough. He eventually got to kind of where you... Uh, are wasn't there in the beginning. When in the administration, his trade policy is com a complete anathema to what most conservatives have been pushing on trade for a long period of time. Uh, on several fronts, it was almost his willingness to diverge away from what had been traditional ideology, which was a draw and I think a constant frustration where I was covering lawmakers on Capitol Hill who were probably more aligned with you. So I, I think that's where I get stuck. I, I don't understand how you can say he's dramatically different now than what he was back in 16 on the policy side. Well, Phil, I just uh, tune in, turn up the volume, because the, the message is changing right now. It really is. And not just the president, but some of his... Did he ever care you know, about policy? Some of the other candidates in the field. That was always kind of the question, though. Did he actually care about policy? Was that ever the reason that he was elected president in the first place? Well, I, I think, I think we, were, we were elected in 2016 to turn this country around af after the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression under Barack Obama. Uh, and, and to turn back this kind of rising tide of socialism that, of course, has all come of age uh, under Joe Biden and a party largely driven by the philosophies of, uh, of Bernie Sanders. Look, we ran on that agenda, and I'm incredibly proud of the fact that the Trump-Pence administration was a conservative administration. You speak about trade. Uh, President Trump did introduce the, the notion of fair trade as a part of free trade, but we also went out there and worked hard. I traveled the country to canvas and develop support for what became the largest trade deal in American history, the USMCA. We redid our trade deal with South Korea. You know, and with regard to national security, it may he be one of the biggest... He sat down with Kim Jong-un. He had the Helsinki press conference with right. President Putin. Uh, some of his moves in terms of trying to remove troops from certain places that I, I just can't fathom was in line with where you are on national security issues. Uh, none of those things are things that the Congressman Mike Pence that I covered long ago when we were both much younger, uh, I think would have supported. You didn't say anything publicly at the time, which was your approach. Um, and I think it was widely uh, understood as your approach. Well, Phil, what, what was there to say? We had the largest increase investment in our national defense since the Reagan administration. We held our allies in Europe responsible for their commitment to live up to our common defense. And before we left office, our NATO allies were spending more than $100 billion more in our common defense. We renegotiated our, our common defense agreement with South Korea. And of course, we unleashed our military. They took down the ISIS caliphate, 58 cruise missiles twice into Syria. We took down Qasem Soleimani. Uh, we demonstrated the ability to use American force. We strengthened our American military. But what I hear from the former president, and frankly, from others, yeah, how, whether how it's war raging, changed, well, well it's, it it's war raging in Eastern Europe. I hear the former president saying, we'll end it in a day. The, the, the only way you end the war in Ukraine in a day, Phil, is by giving Vladimir Putin what he wants, which, uh, and do you think which Vivek Ramaswamy, that? Vivek Ramaswamy's uh, idea is to do just that. Let, let Putin keep what he's taken and uh, promise Ukraine will never join NATO. And then he adds to that uh, a willingness to let uh, China have Taiwan after 2028. And incomprehensibly, Vivek, who's a, who's a good man, I met him a couple of years ago, he's a good family man. He, he actually said we wouldn't use military force uh, to defend Israel in an attack by Iran. I, I mean, but, but this is the populist strain and the pulling back from American leadership on the world stage that was not uh, how, uh, how we operated in the Trump-Pence administration. We, we were strong. We had a strong military. 
We stood with our allies. We stood with Israel as no administration literally in my lifetime had done. And, uh, and, and I believe that now we're hearing a withdrawal from American leadership in the world. We're, we're, we're being told that we have to make a choice between solving problems here at home in the right. wake of the failed policies of the Biden administration or leading in the world. And as, as I've said many times, you know, anybody that says that we can't solve the problems here at home and be the leader of the free world has a pretty small view of the greatest nation on earth.